So thank you all for uh, attending today. We have uh, the second edition here, the second gathering of the Indigenous and Newcomers chat. And I'm going to welcome you all uh, officially in, in my culture. Uh, my name is Crystal, Crystal Mendishnikas, Crystal Waban, uh, Omami Winini Pukwakdegan. Uh, and I'm going to burn a little bit of sage here. Got my sage and my abalone shell. And uh, just going to smudge and help put some good energy and some good thoughts and asking for spiritual support and wellness for us as we start off on this chat. So I'm smudging you all. Hope you can much my my virtual group here and uh thanking thanking the ancestors for being with us today so um again this is the indigenous and newcomer friendship chat part deux, and i'm Kristen desley and i'm the indigenous red program coordinator at kairos and i'm also an omemi winini anishinaabe clay from the Pacific first nation and for for this gathering, we're going to just practice a, a few pieces of the protocol where if we're not, um, if we're not the, the speaker, we're going to ask that you keep your microphone on mute. And uh, this time, just to uh, kind of do something a little bit differently, um, Adriana had a great suggestion about um, changing your, your screen name to include your location. Uh, so that's something fun if you don't know um, where to find that. If you go on our participant list, you can actually right click and uh, change your name, rename yourself. Um, so just welcoming everyone together and uh, again, thanking you for taking the time out of all of the different web gatherings you could have chosen today. I'm, we're very happy that you chose this one and uh, I'll let Alfredo talk a little bit more about uh, the background of this initiative. Sure, thanks very much, Crystal, and, um, and thanks everybody, of course, for, for joining us. I, I recognize that, as, as Rick was saying, you know, thanks to and otherwise everybody would be, you know, like a staff meeting. Uh, the difference being is that we're probably going to be talking about things that we don't necessarily talk about, you know, uh, not even in the surface, you know, as, as staff. Uh, so um, I won't go into too much detail in terms of the, you know, the Indigenous Newcomer Friendship Initiative and, and, and why are we doing this, in the sense that most of you already know and, and been, you know, uh, hearing from us, you know, so, something that, that we've been doing for quite a number of years now. Uh, we met with Adriana, uh, you know, prior to this meeting and last week as well to, to talk about what, what this was. Uh, and so th also thank you, Adriana, for, for joining us. Um, but uh, the idea obviously is to find some common ground and talk about, you know, what, you know, why are we doing this? What is it in common between indigenous and newcomer peoples uh, living here in Turtle Island? Uh, what, is, what is it that we can, you know, learn from one another and to uh, collaborate with one another? How can we support one another? So I really enjoy Crystal's introduction in terms of this margin and, 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 and asking you know, the Creator and then our ancestors to be with us and, and ask for support because that's what this is all about. And we agreed that we were going to do this introduction very short so we have more time for Adriana and, and each and every one of you to actually ask questions. So I'm going to leave it there and, and, and the other partner with, that, with us here in, in, in this Indigenous Newcomer Friendship uh, Initiative is Connie. So Connie, anything? Um, thank you very much, Alfredo. And just to echo, you know, our welcome to Adriana for joining us this afternoon and to all colleagues who are joining us today. I have a very unstable internet connection. So often, you know, I see people freezing. So uh, if I, if you see, See me talking but not hearing what I'm saying, it's because my computer or my internet connection is mm -hmm. yeah, bad. So just to say that. Thank you. Oh, yeah, really, really great to uh, gather up these different uh, justice pillars of Kairos and to come together in this initiative. And 
Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, a little bit more in depth now, um, but I'll, I'll leave the more in depth uh, introduction to Adrienne herself. But I was really fortunate to um, just happen to meet the wonderful Adriana in February when I had uh, participated in a seed keeper gathering in Akwesasne uh, Island. Uh, so that's the Haudenosaunee community, which borders uh, New York, the Ontario and, and New York border there. And uh, we, we did a little bit of carpooling. We did a little bit of hours of talking because that's the ground we covered. And uh, we spent a great day together with another group of people. And I was really fortunate to be able to uh, witness Adriana uh, and her skill set in action. And uh, she's a very um, talented and capable artist uh, who is actually drawing in social justice work. And that's a really cool combination to me personally. And the more I learned about her work, uh, the more it seemed that she would be a great guest to have in this space. So Adriana, I'll, I'll let you uh, take it away. <laughs> sure. Um, so my name is Adriana Contreras. I was born in, in Colombia and I moved to the West Coast here, uh, Conselish territories when I was 15. Um, I moved with my whole family, fortunately. Uh, we were um, a few of the families that jumped in on the opportunity to move to Canada when Y2K was coming and the world was going to end and they needed a lot of computer engineers. and. My dad is a, a trained community engineer, so that gave us like a pathway to, to come here. But when we arrived, none of us spoke English. None of us knew where we were coming. Like it was a bit of a, of a wild ride for the first few years. Um, as Crystal was saying, we met in a pretty amazing way because um, that uh, trip to Ottawa to do that work with the Seed Keepers Network was my first kind of like freelance gig um, on my own after like leaving my full-time job to work independently as a graphic recorder and uh, illustrator. So I'll tell you more that afterwards. But um, I think a lot of the conversation will, will be around land and like recognizing where we stand and those movements in, in from one place to another and like how that allows us to maybe go deeper inside of who we are, um, but also like what, what those broken connections are. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen because I have like a few images to kind of get us kind of, um, um, I don't know, grounded into here, but also somewhere else. <laughs> so I'll just share now. I think you might be able to see that. Yes. So, um, I was um, mentioning earlier to Crystal and Alfredo when we were just uh, meeting before to make sure everything was working that um, I had the opportunity to sit down and look at the map of Colombia again. I haven't done this in a long, long time, probably since I was in elementary school and realizing like my misconceptions of where some things are in my brain and where they are in this map. Um, <laughs> and so I was born here in this area uh, in Bogota, the capital city, which is in a, um, in a mountain. It's a flat mountain, um, super high up in altitude. I think it's 27, 2,700 meters from sea level. Um, and this is where I lived most of my, until I was 15. Uh, and my dad comes from this area over here on the coast. And he moved from here to Bogota when he was seven years old. So um, for me, this, I never thought of it about, like, about being migration, but it, but it is internal migration. And it was, um, it was something that was decided by my uncle, by my, by my grandpa, um, in part because there are more opportunities in the city, but also maybe some untold stories of fleeing violence. Um, Colombia, unfortunately, has been um, dealing with civil war for many, many, many decades and it presents itself uh, differently depending where you are in the country. Um, it's, a, it's a country that has a lot of richness in 
natural resources, a lot of richness in food production. We have access to the ocean. Um, and it's also very culturally rich, but also it's kind of like a, like a, a gift and also a curse because there has been a lot of intervention because people want to get to these resources. And um, so this is kind of like where, where, I, where I find myself, like where I'm from and where I call home, even though I don't go there as often. Um, the last time I was there was last year and it had been 10 years since I had been there. And it had been more than 25 years since I had been in this region. The last time I was there was when I was eight years old. Um, so I just wanted to show a little bit of the places that um, that are kind of close to my heart. This is like the back alley, uh, <laughs> a window, like a, what you see from the window of my one of my grandma's house. She doesn't live. Um, she passed away many years ago, and the house stayed in the family. I think now it's is not longer in the family so this was like my last chance to to experience this feeling of looking out that window and seeing those tiles and um not much had changed when i went back um and this is just to show like the distance that that i've traveled um a few times maybe like through toronto and that um and this is also in in so I'll, I guess I'll go back a little bit. This one here is not Bogota itself. It's a small town called Chia, which is the name of the of the goddess moon in the Muisca culture. So all this land is, is Muisca land, um, but it's not a lot of, there's not a lot of knowledge unless, or at least I didn't grow up with a lot of that knowledge. I kind of stumbled upon it and and you, I feel that I really have to go and dig deep to be able to learn more, even though I live in, in that land. Um, this, this here is the facade of, the, um, of one of the neighborhood houses, pretty much, or like the house of culture, like La Casa de la Cultura, where I spent a lot of time. And when I went back, I saw the mural again. It had always been there since I can remember. And it has a lot of indigenous iconography and all around and the, even the, the new library they built. And it's again, like there is like, it's, they're like little glimpses of the culture that is there, but not like a deep understanding or even a deep respect. Um, at least not in the place where I, the people that I was, that I grew up with. And this is an image of Bogota, very crowded city. And this is uh, another one of those images, just glimpses of, of, um, of just walking around and like situating myself when I when I went back. And the, the next few are going are going to be images of when I went to the north part, so where my dad was born and grew up. So this is an image of Cartagena, and this was taken um, in one of the in one of the walls of the city. It's, um, it's a city that is amurallada. It has a, like a huge wall all around because it's by the ocean and it was a way of protecting the, the colony. Uh, but it was also the part of, this, of the country or the part of the, of the colonial uh, kingdom in, in Latin America where a lot of the slave trade happened. Um, so it's a very complex, feeling being there because I love the place and it's a beautiful um, architecture wise and um, even like the plants and just being there is beautiful but it's also very conflicting because you know that there is a lot of suffering um, that happened there and then oh, I have a few more but they're not there and then um, yeah and I think I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there we can maybe start diving deep inside of the the conversation we were having but something i love about this photo and i think is the connecting it to to maybe things we're seeing right now during this era of covid is nature taking over in this case i don't think it's specifically that what is happening but it just reminded me of that as well there is places where where plants are growing through the cracks and kind of taking back that space that was that was imposed on them. Yeah. That must have been really uh, 
just really intense to go back after such a long time. And then you also on top of that have, um, you know, an, an old, a, pers a different perspective because you've, you've, you've grown and you've aged and in that different kind of way that happens. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and what, what, you know, unlock, unlock a little bit of what that trip was like for you? Mm -hmm. Um, so Maybe I'll just, I'm gonna have some water. <laughs> mm. yeah, it took me a while to decide to go, to go back for many reasons, but I went back with my cousin who had been living here in Vancouver for a few years and we just wanted to, to reconnect and do something together. And when I gave her the dates of when I was planning to go she told me that it was carnival time in another town nearby and she's like we have to go we've never been there and it was a way of connecting with part of our family history from our dad's my dad and her dad's um past that we didn't we haven't really had a chance to really dive deep into i'm, I'm having something on my throat sorry no problem <coughs> Yeah, that was something that we um, had talked a bit about having uh, such a, a unified relationship with and a lot of um, a lot of people when they come to Canada and they learn about Indigenous, like First Nations people, history and Inuit and Métis. Um, you know, and I, I believe I said something similar in the last web chat where, you know, it's really those that, that com that's a common theme for Indigenous people is to have this impact of colonialism, this shared um, reverberation through generations and, um, you know, so much that you don't even know. This often happens that when I'm talking, I talk really fast and then my throat gets dry. <laughs> and many times it's like also something that has to do with, um, I think it's like probably something somatic, like something in the body that is like, that needs to come out. So I might need to take a little, <clears throat> a little break and just grab something for my throat if that's okay. Yeah. One second. I'll be back. I'm sorry. Sure, no problem. So just what we were telling uh, in the chat a little bit, if you have any questions for Adriana, um, please do feel free to, to put it into the chat and we'll be sure to get to, to those questions as soon as we can. I see Gabby's got one. Um, or a really great talking point there that we can kind of touch on. Um, it was neat to to meet uh, Adriana in that setting for the Seed Keepers gathering because we both brought this really different um, kind of, we were both compelled in different ways to get involved for different reasons, but when it kind of gets back to the same, down to the, to the, to the brass knuckles, if you will, it's about food sovereignty and that autonomy and, um, you know, how as Indigenous people, it doesn't really seem to matter where you are, you're still um, struggling to get those, uh, those basics. And um, whenever, whenever you're good, Adriana, feel free to jump in. Uh, Gabby has a, a point here that she'd ask that you maybe touch on. Give you a Did you second. see the, the chat there, Adriana? Uh, you're muted. Your 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 microphone is muted. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm not sure I can access the chat right now from where I am. Let me check. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Um. So something that I was mentioning to to Alfredo and Crystal earlier is that for me. This trip to Colombia was very different because I was, in a way, a little bit hyper aware of trying to find like glimpses of like that indigenous connection <clears throat> because like it took me leaving Colombia, coming to Canada, 
spending many, many years here, also not understanding where I was situated here in, in this land. And then starting to make those connections to then go back to Colombia and start to look for them. So when I was driving around or even after I went to a, uh, on a hike with my cousin, I would end up in places where I would see the entrances of cabildos, which are the indigenous communities. And Alfredo was telling me earlier, which I didn't know this, that it's kind of, it's, it's not like a reservation, but it's a similar kind of imposed structure um, in, in Latin America. So those are sections where, where these communities were, were displaced and put into these locations, away from the lands where they had inhabited for so many years. So it, it just made me realize how, like that I, there is so much that I was that I've been missing for so long that I still need to learn, and that those are, I think that those are relationships that kind of arrive when when they arrive. I don't know, like um, like the fact that Crystal and I met going to this gathering and we spend like two or more hours in the car talking to each other. Like those are things that you can't just. I don't know, coordinate or going to a class and learn. Like those are just relationships that that are formed with time. And and I just I just wish that more people get that opportunity. And I think that's why when this invitation came came up to to be part of this conversation, I think it just I just hope that new people that are arriving and even people that have been here for a long time like I have. Um, have opportunities to break those barriers to connect because um, like in my case I I don't really know like those threats of of history because a lot of those records are not ex non-existent um, so I know roughly where where my mom is from the city but I don't know what else happened before that and then from my dad, I know where he's from, and I don't know much of what happened before that. And I don't know who, like if I were to do a search for ancestry, I don't know how far back we would go either. And there is, um, again, like the, the records in the churches have a specific agenda and they have a specific reason for being there. And maybe names were changed, like if there is a, if, I've always thought that in, in my family there's for sure some some connection with the slave trade, but then there is no like how are we gonna find those those records? And then after many, many years we've started to realize that there is also a, a strong connection with, with Syria and the Middle East and Turkey and like what are those connections? And and then it started to to become into a really, really complex um, benefit from are at the cost of people in Colombia suffering from the armed conflict, suffering from social injustice, uh, suffering from, from total exploitation. And many of those things um, are because Canadian companies are there. Mining, mining companies, oil extraction, and it's very difficult. So maybe I'll jump to this slide here. Um, Last year in August, I was invited by um, a good friend, a family friend who is involved in the Colombian Truth Commission. I'm covering the image with the chat. <laughs> uh, uh, with the Colombian Truth Commission. And um, what is happening there is that, I don't know if many of you are aware, Colombia signed a peace treaty between the government and the guerrillas, uh, the FARC, and part of the process of making this um, peace agreement go forward is having a commission that will search for the truth. And what is special about the Truth Commission with Colombia is that they are making a huge effort to also include the voices of people that are exiled. So there are groups working in Europe, uh, all over Latin America, in the US, here in Canada, and um, the idea is to be able to get as many testimonials as possible and to, to get 
to get those stories that are often lost because people leave and they just maybe don't want to talk about what happened. Um, so this is um, a recording that I did um, based on many other recordings that I did live at events uh, with the commissioner who was here and also with the group of volunteers that are working here in DC. And some of the things that they that that kind of stuck to me a lot is this is this idea that we need to open space for the for space and time for the stories that haven't been told. So family stories, and I think every time I, I read this, I situate myself like with my history and then I start to think about other people in Colombia, but then I think about all the other immigrants here that might have that same situation. So the younger de generation that doesn't know what really happened to their parents and why they're here. And then I think about residential school survivors and their kids and why the stories haven't been told and what have been told and what is the repercussion of that. And then another big part of it, um, of this whole process is the idea of joining all those pieces of, of a collective truth because we all hold a little bit of, of, of that knowledge or our own personal experience that no one can tell us that is right or wrong, like it's our own and we can, and we can share it. And by putting them together, then we can start to understand all of those patterns and and like make visible things that that are not so visible, and also things that we might feel that are that are only unique to us. And then we start to see the patterns that are also happening to more and more people. Um, and it's it's a difficult process. Um, the Truth Commission doesn't have a lot of time to to pick up this. This testimonials, which is a bit sad. Um, they have we have two more months to complete the work. So my 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 work has been mostly being able to produce uh, graphic pieces and help to get the word out that way. Uh, but we found that there is still a lot of fear because even though the peace process was went through and the agreement was signed. The violence hasn't ended, it has transformed into something else. So it's very difficult for anyone to really feel that they want to go forward and, and, and tell their stories, even though there are guarantees of like things being secure, like this information is not going to be shared publicly unless people want to and all of this. Privacy is very big, but people are still not, there. people are not comfortable um, sharing these stories. and. And I think that what I find difficult is that all these processes that should take longer and that are not, I mean, they, they cannot be put into like a time frame that is so tight because they are adjusted to institutional timelines, then they, we lose opportunities. We lose opportunities for the connections that, that need to happen because if you're dealing with a conflict that lasted who knows how many decades, like since the 40s until now, like a few years is not gonna allow people to really heal. Um, but maybe it's a starting point, but we've been talking a lot about uh, with the Truth Commission of what happens after, like this document is, is written, what happens after? And I think that is, um, I, I, I draw a lot of parallels with with the truth and reconciliation here as well. So that's why it's it's been very yeah, it's been it's been a lot of reflection and a lot of like just time for thinking and and uh, and asking questions. I think more than anything, all of these processes just are about asking questions. But but for me it's also understanding like what what it means to be situated in a specific place and and what that can allow, and what also it, it doesn't allow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there are questions from anyone or reflections. Well, I just want to touch quickly on, you mentioned, you know, that healing part and, and also looking at this graphic recording that you've done. Um, you know, I, I personally, and, and, and a lot of folks do, they feel very strongly that art is a healing um, expression, a healing release, a healing of communication, of representation. And 
um, I, I'm really struck by the beauty of this piece that, and, and I know you have another version in Spanish. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, when I look at it and how beautifully balanced it is and, and how it really catches the eye and it really engages the person looking at it to, to draw them in to read and, and to, to consider for a moment, um, you know, some, some people can't pull this off with a, a graphics, you know, where it's like an auto paste into shapes and things like that. And you, and I've been really lucky to see you uh, work freehand, just doing this beautiful stuff. So I, I can just imagine the care that went into crafting this piece, but um, is there having this kind of relationship with art and uh, a, a particular role where you're recording people and their expressions. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? How how that's been a, a you know a healing component, but also a component of your activism. Um, so I think art itself was kind of what got me through the first years of moving to Canada. <laughs> um, in high school, I. I signed up for art classes right away and it was like a relief to be able to be in a space where I could communicate without having to worry about the language um, itself. Like it was a different type of language, it was a visual language and it was very freeing. And I think that my art teachers in high school kind of got me through things. I'm still very close to, to the teacher I had in grade 12. We're still talking often and exchanging ideas and and I always tell her that like her, her, her believing that I could do something really made a big difference because when you move to a new place and you don't have the language and also you don't have like maybe the financial resources to do a few things like take classes here and there or just even situate yourself. It, it, it creates a lot of, at least for me, I don't, I'm just talking from my personal experience. It created a lot of insecurities on what I could do and I was very attached to my school in Colombia. Like I, the first few years living here, I would dream about going to school there. <laughs> and I would like walk through the hallways and like try to go back, back to, to my, to the place that I knew because it was a school that I went to for, for so long, like from grade two until grade nine. So it was quite the shock. Like I think school really like shook me a lot when I, when I moved here. So having that connection to the arts made a huge difference. And um, and then I decided to go to university to do sociology, but I, I switched after the first year to do the, the arts program at SFU, the Simon Fraser University. And um, and after that, I, well, that get, opened up the spaces for a lot of things. University opened up the spaces for, for many things. Like at university was the first time I, that I actually heard about residential schools in an anthropology class like high school they never mentioned this and then i was also doing latin american studies at the same time so that's when i learned about um the coup in chile and my teacher also one of those teachers that that now is a friend she's uh, she was exiled from chile because of of the coup and uh and she just showed me a whole different world of what latin america was and so it was also a, a going back to to questioning like all the things that I learned <laughs> before, but it was also but but it was always through the arts. So it was through literature, through cinema, uh, through visual arts. Um, so that has been my connection then to to my community here in BC. Um, I've worked in the arts for many years. I worked um, uh, as a gallery administrator an arts programmer for dance. Uh, I've done a lot of marketing promotion, so like letting people know why the arts matter. And a few years ago, through many like interesting connections, <laughs> one of my ex coworkers told me that she was working as a, with graphic recording and illustration and told me that there was a, an opportunity for a scholarship. And I applied and I thought it was one of those scholarships where you go and like, you do a class and then you go away and nothing happens and and it wasn't like that I did my my training and then I went home and then a few weeks later Sam Brad who was my my mentor for this work he started to like 
ask me like, so have you been practicing? I want to give you work. Let's like, let's get started. And it took me a long time to, to, to feel that I could do it. But then 2019 in, in June, um, he told me, okay, you're ready. You're going to go do this recording for the <laughs> migrant workers forum. And what is amazing about the work is that we're, especially with, um, we're often paired with things that he knows we, that are close to, to our understanding, to our experience, and that we can do well because we connect and we can listen. So this work is a lot about, yes, drawing, but it's also about listening and being present and, and understanding, um, understanding the essence of the conversations. And for me, it's been a way of reclaiming my own artistic practice because um, after doing the university degree and having to find work, I started to work more in admin positions where I was supporting a lot of artists, but not doing my own work. So this has been a way of going back to my work, but also staying connected with all the artistic community. Um, and then I guess another aspect of, of arts has been movement and dance and like that embodied uh, presence. And I've been very lucky to, to be able to connect with a lot of indigenous artists based here and and I start to see the connections we've yeah we've talked a lot about connections of land and food and dance and and song related to 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 that understanding of our connection to land um, and where we are. Um, Adriana, it's uh, Cheryl uh, in Toronto. Uh, I was going to ask you. Um, uh, if Indigenous art, uh, especially in the West Coast, because the West uh, Indigenous nations in the West Co Coast, the art, as you know, is so incredible, so powerful. And um, I wanted to know uh, how that was impacting you. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know if you recall the first time that you encountered this art and what your first impressions were. Ooh. <laughs> um. Oh, that's a hard one. It's, it's, it's difficult because I can say that maybe the first times I encountered them were maybe at the museums, like Museum of Anthropology. But if I go even farther behind, like DC ferries, like they like gift shops, but then, but then you think about like, what is that really? Like, is it, what is it? <laughs> like, is it commodified or is it like, who made this? But uh, but I think that's probably what it is. Like souvenirs was probably the first time I encountered any any not maybe artwork but iconography and but work itself. I think it's been more it's been more through dance. But I do I do recall something that I was gonna mention earlier and I forgot that um, I think it took me about ten years to really feel that feel that I wanted to stay in Vancouver or like that I wanted to stay on the west coast because I always had like these ideas like I'll go live somewhere else or I'll move back to Colombia or maybe I'll go live in Spain like all this and I think that's also just youth you always want to go somewhere else but <laughs> but um but my dad started to do my dad also paints he's a, he's an artist he's a painter and a, and a, and a photographer on top of his work um as an engineer he he's made it very like like he he has dedicated a lot of his time to doing that and he started to do a series of paintings where he would take aerial maps of the city and and start to trace the roads and start to trace like the the way the city was established and then looking at indigenous um drawings and patterns and seeing where those connections were and it was more like an experimentation and an exploration but through his work and through his like going deep into the maps was where i was like okay this is where i have to stay like this is it like he did that work and then i started to think this morning when i was thinking about that is that um when we first moved here the first few weeks my dad would sit down with a map every night to study the city <laughs> and he wanted to know where we were and 
And I was like, it was so strange to me. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm just studying the map. And, and so like the fact that 10 years later, he would do those paintings using those maps and those aerial views, it was like he was leading the way for me to, to feel that, yeah, like I now understand why, why we're here and why, why I have to let go of like, of my need to go somewhere else. Because I think one of the big issues that I found is that and, and I hear, I have these conversations with a lot of friends that move here and they're like, oh, there's not a lot of architecture. There is not a lot of history in this place. Everything is torn down and built again. I'm like, yeah, but that's, that's just, I don't know, a Eurocentric way of seeing things because it's not about that. It's about the land. Like, it's about going out and like feeling what's here. So if, if we're trying to come here, trying to recreate something else, like try to recreate a colonial city and like walk around like what we're used to then we're not gonna appreciate what's here and I think that's what happened yeah it doesn't really answer your question so much yeah but. no that was a beautiful <laughs> answer I love it and I mean I'm originally from Vancouver in that I was born there and lived there uh, for a great deal of my life before um, moving here but I always am puzzled or thinking about, you know, the settler and the settler experience and this ease of picking up and moving wherever. And um, think of, I mean, generally the indigenous perspective of such the important connection to land. And certainly in BC, um, the land is very, very important, extremely important. Um, but I just loved what you said about recognizing that um, there's more to to the place than just the buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and recently, like the past few weeks, I've started to also start to uncover things from here that I was like, oh, that's like heartbreaking. But <laughs> there, is, um, there is a statue in Gastown of this man, Gassy Jack, who had yes. a bar. Mm -hmm. And like it's the place that you go and take photos and you walk around Gastown and you take your family there when they come to visit. and. Like my family doesn't come here very often because of visas. They don't get to travel, but the, the very few that have been able to come and visit. Like we walked through Gaston and then I saw this video shared recently by a, a, an indigenous artist that I respect very much. And she was walking through Gaston and talking about Cassie Jack and the fact that, that he had these bars where all these people, all these settlers would come and get drunk and like the relationship of, of alcohol and violence against indigenous women and that specific area in, in, in Vancouver and that displacement. And then the other day I was seeing a photo of another area here, Granville Island, where I spent a lot of time and where a lot of the traditional fishing happened and then it became this industrial park and now it's a cultural space. But that displacement is still there. So it's a place I love very much, but I also like, oh, now I go there and now I'm not gonna be able to not think about this. And then two years, two years ago, for the first time after like 20 years of living here, I went to the PE, the Pacific Exhibition Fair. I never, I had never gone. And I went with my family and, and we walked around and it was fun. And then two or three weeks, no, two or, yeah, like maybe a month after. I went to see a play by one of my coworkers um, that was about the Japanese internment camps and they happen in that place um, where the animals are now dis displayed during the, exhi the exhibition fair. So I walked to that place and then I walked in, I, I saw the play, the play was like super, like it, it's, it was site specific and, and very much to the core. And the story was about, um, a sister and two sisters and and one of the sisters had a baby and my sister had just had a baby so it, like it was very personal and it just kind of like completely broke me and and it's it's those like so many layers in the city so for me it's become really um, like interesting to to walk around and and try to find all those stories the, the untold ones like we have the statues and like we have Cassie Jack and that's there but like what's underneath those cobblestones what else happened there and I think we're just starting to to do that here in the city. So there is a festival called Vines Festival um, that is based in parks. And the person that runs it, she wants to 
like unearth those stories of the parks like what are the parks like who gets to enjoy them now what was there before um and 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 i think those are the the type of artic artistic connections where i'm drawn to now where it's it's beyond uh what we can share visually but what are all the questions and i think for me it's just always about like the ongoing questions like digging deep and and like looking at who's not there why aren't they there and yeah yeah because i i get a lot of comments about vancouver being so new and like such a new city and they're like well no <laughs> the land has been here for like as long as everywhere else it's just that we don't have those stories or at least like the people that tell me that like we just don't have access to those stories and and i mean we don't we shouldn't have to have it like it's not something we can just go and grab it like they, they will arrive to us if 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 it feels right and if it's if it's for us to get those teachings but but it's it's about approaching the land with respect i think yeah Wow, Adriana, you've uh, you've really brought us to a really natural place. Um, but you know, when we we think about art, and uh, like I mentioned before, uh, for myself, and especially because we have that sociology kind of connection, that you can't help think about what that activism piece is in the art, and what what are the social connections that can be made, and. And one of the things we had talked about putting out in this uh, web chat was a, a question of, to our participants of how can we build relationships? How can outside community offer support and allyship? And I feel like you just really beautifully um, brought that out for us of, you know, what are those stories? What are the layers? Um, what can we unearth about where, where we are, where, you know, the land we're standing on, the, the places that we're on, how, how can we um, demonstrate allyship in a real way? And, and I, I really like that idea of um, the parks, starting with the parks. And that's, that's I'm going to be thinking about that one for a while. Um, <laughs> well, this year, because, because of, of all the restrictions with events, uh, the festival will happen big part um online so everyone can access it um maybe crystal will send you the link to their website and it happens in august but they'll start like sharing more things and you can see what they've done in the past um it is a lot about connection and friendship and i i can't really talk much about it because i'm, I'm not really involved in the organizing of it but i do invite people to to look it up because i think it's a beautiful it's a beautiful model for what the arts can do and and something else that i often like to tell people when when we talk about like ways of of creating solidarity is 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 to look beyond what we're offered in media uh, because a lot of the stories in other parts of the world they're just they just don't reach us unless we really go looking for them and I think mostly just to keep these places in in mind, like to keep Colombia in mind. Like if you see something in the news about Colombia, then maybe look for other sources, just not stay in whatever you see first. But also like if if, if a big event happens, like while we're living now, like we 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 receive a lot of news from the US and maybe some news from Europe but very little from Latin America. And I think it's just important to, to just even keep that in mind. It's like, what is happening around the world? Like, what else is going on? Like, this is, we're feeling this here, this way. What does it feel somewhere else where the resources are not the same? Or not just from that point of view, but also on the other side. It's like, what can those places teach us? There might be solutions that are coming out of Latin America that we don't know. Because also we, we're often, shown the despair and the lack of success or the poverty but there is also a lot of a lot of great things coming out of many parts of the world that we just don't get to got, don't get to experience and that i say that from myself as well because i because i i can dive into the negative many times and 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 more recently i've started to look for those stories of success or of things to celebrate as well. 
Yeah, it's important to remember to keep keep looking for those hopeful pieces to mm -hmm. certainly lift. So we're we're coming to a close with our time with our with our very that was a really fast hour I have to say. Um, if there are any questions, um, I noticed that Giselle uh, shared a, a thank you about how how her story uh, uh, resonated uh, from what she heard uh, you share. So that's that's always great when uh, when when people can can hear a bit of their own experience. Um, is there any any final last or burning <laughs> moments calling to? Uh, the burning that I have is just to say thank you to, to Adriana and, and of course to, to Cheryl and I mean to Crystal, sorry, and, and Connie for helping put this together. And, and, and of course to each and every one of you, our colleagues from Kairos to, to, to support us and to come and, and, and listen to, to the stories. Um, it's really, really appreciated. Uh, you know, um, we've been talking about uh, Zoom fatigue. You know, we've been talking about all of this, and we know that we've been in several meetings, one after the other after the other. Uh, but still, it, it's it's important for us to to, to hear Aliana's story. Uh, we can summarize it, but we will put this uh, on online later on, so so we can go we can go back and see it. But you, as Crystal said earlier, Adriana, you beautifully touched on most of the aspects that we wanted to bring up in conversations like this and to hear you and, and Crystal interact is to me the embodiment of, of what Indigenous newcomer friendships are. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really great to, to meet everybody. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us and be sure to tell all your friends so you don't miss the next one. Um, we watch, we watch so much, it was so great.